you put on an event like this these days, you always wonder how many people are going to turn up. We've all been bombarded with media programmes, some good, some not so good, some tasteful, some not so tasteful, like that one. Um, and you start to wonder if anyone's really going to be interested anymore. So it's lovely to see so many people here tonight. Um, oh, it's two clicks each time. As I'm talking, please feel free to ask questions. I'm very conscious that it's hard to keep in your head anything you want to ask until the end of the speech. So if there is something, just stick your hands up and ask away. Otherwise, I'll ask questions and then ask questions at the end. Do you want to turn at once? Should I let my second down before we carry on? And um, one of the ways I got involved in learning about the First World War was, as everybody else at the moment, gets into family history. There's more and more programmes that you can use um, online, more and more things you can watch on the TV. There's some of them there that I've enjoyed in the past. It's my poor husband's horror because he can't get away from them. I watch them all the time. And I started to look at my own family history. And my family is not what I call a military family. We have little bits military history scattered amongst it. My husband's got a little bit amongst his, but we're not really a, a service family. That being said, that's my cousin. He's a vice air marshal. You don't see much of him, but he's there, and that's my generation. If we go back a generation, there's a story which my family really loves, which is um, Johnny Horan. He was uh, an air gunner in Burma, and um, during the Second World War, he was um, attacked by a group of Japanese aircraft. And during that attack, he was fatally wounded. He carried on fighting. He jammed the gun up to his chest. He shot on with one arm. And he took down four Japanese planes before they managed to land on the beach. And if he hadn't done that, his whole crew would have died. So that was a kind of legend in our family. It was making me feel a bit <laughs> even now. So, that was, again, going back one generation. Going back another <coughs> generation, we never heard any stories. And I think you might have experienced this in your own families, that you might not know who actually served, who died. People didn't talk about it. Quite often the direct descendants didn't exist because they hadn't had a, a family of their own. Um, and this particular chap, Arthur James Sear, I only found out about when my great aunt died, um, who was his little sister. She had been born in 1906. And she absolutely adored her brother, but she never really spoke about him. So it was on her death that the story came out. And he died at Lille Clearing Station after the Battle of Neuve Chapelle. So it was a particularly nasty period in the war. And I'm still finding things out about him. One of the things about doing this research has been that I've learned a lot about how to do it. So when I started researching Arthur about two years ago, I knew very little about how to process the research. Now I've gone back to it in the last couple of days, I've found out so much more, and I'm absolutely thrilled today to find out that there is actually a plaque dedicated to him, and him only, in a church in Islington that's hidden, unfortunately. They've put it away somewhere since 1988, but it's there, and I'm trying to track it down now. And um, he was uh, in the Boys Brigade. So that's my family. And as I was learning things, it's a huge, steep learning curve to learn about everything that there is to do with the First World War. There's so much information to take in. The medal system, the, the regiments, the battalions, the uniforms, the badges, there's so much. And I'm very lucky that I have a support group of local historians who can help, Bob, Graham, Francis, and some others that aren't here tonight who I can ask questions if I need to. So it's a very supportive relationship we have with other historians, which I really cherish. The other way that I got into this research was I was working in the British Legion Hall, which some of you may know, in Sparrow Lane, and I made it into a little hall like that. And I had lots of members of the British Legion coming in, and as Carolyn was saying, a lot of them would talk to me about their memories of the British Legion over the last few decades. And they told me that they just had a list of names and regiments. They didn't really know much about the men who served. And I thought that was a great pity. Um, it was something that I felt we should do something about. So I started to look into it for myself. And this is the other reason that I, I wanted to do that. Um, we hear these words all the time. They're all so familiar. Do we really listen to them if all we do is 
hear the words and go home afterwards. I wanted to do something about that. I wanted to make sure we did remember these men and that our children would remember them and that our children's children would remember them. And writing the book has been something that I've been able to do to achieve that. So I started my research with 46 men on memorial, as people have done all around the country over the last few years. Um, I'm often hearing stories about other historians doing the same work in other places. So that's the starting point for everyone, is the memorial. I don't know how many of you are not local, but our memorial is only 10 years old. That one was, was built quite recently. And the names were taken directly from the tablet in St Bartholomew's Church. Now, that was done at the time, so it, it's, it's good, solid information that I hoped would be correct, but I had a suspicion it might not be, and certainly we found that names weren't right on it, and the people were missing, and it didn't worry me that it was like that, because that is a, a date stamp in time, that's our memorial, and it's something that will never change, and it's based on something that happened with the approval of the, the families at the time. But I thought we could go further and find out a bit more as a tribute to those men. So that was my starting point. There's the tablet, which is in the church. I don't know if any of you have seen it. It's a beautiful piece of work. Very small, very simple, but it, it is of the period. What you may not realise, you can see the tablet again there, is that this window, or Melfi screen, is actually part of the memorial. That was done at the time, as part of it, and I think that's stunning, and it's such a shame that people go into the church now and don't realise that that's part of what the families of the fallen did at the time. And the other thing that I found out when I was doing my research was that during the opening ceremony for this tablet and screen, the families were sitting at the back of the church in these pews here. And I thought, that's not very fair, what are they doing at the back of the church? And then I found out about the screen. They were there so they could see and they could participate in the unveiling of that rather beautiful piece of oak. It is stunning. Next to it, before the decorations from the church that over the last year or so, was this list. I don't know where to put it now, but um, it's not on display at the moment. This list was compiled by John Searle, who was the headmaster of the school at the Civic Centre. And it contains the list of the same men but with the addition of their regiments and a bit more information about them where it was known. Um, so that, that was a very useful starting point for me to work with his. I love the story about how he decided to do that list and thought that it would be useful because it was. <laughs> and I, I could go back and say thank you to him, I would. <coughs> um, the next issue that I had writing the book was deciding how far to go because as I was looking at the War Memorial, I was finding out that some of the people on it came from well outside Wooden Bassett. Where do you stop with your research? Who do you include? So that's what the town looked like, and there's a, a copy of that in the book. The town looked like in 1914, with an awful lot that we're familiar with today missing, of course. And that's the geographical area that I decided to work with. Um, it sort of kept growing and shrinking, and. As it grew, I was panicking about whether I'd be able to ever finish this book, and I kept shrinking it down again. And at one point, I was going to include Cliff Pipehart, which is a lovely little village with fantastic stories in it. Um, but then I decided that I couldn't do that because there was a lady researching Cliff Pipehart who was doing a fabulous job, and for me to do a better one, I would have had to spend another couple of months working on it, and I didn't have time to do that. So I decided not to include Cliff Pipehart, and by default, Bushton, which is in between the two. And then there was a little problem. Just there was a lady's grandfather, and she was rather upset he wasn't going to be included. So just at the last minute, I thought, i just go as far as that crossroads. So Walter George Lawrence is in there. He wouldn't be otherwise. Um, there are a couple of men, included in the book, who are outside the area for particular reasons. One, because um, the Vince brothers, one of whom was a deserter, and I thought it was valuable to the book to include a story about desertion. Um, in fact, he, he wasn't in too much trouble at all, and he did get forgiven. Um, and then the other story was one about Tommy Tucker, um, who was uh, um, in a hospital in France when he received an egg from the National Egg Collection that had been sent from Swindon. So he wrote back to Swindon saying, thank you for the egg, I'm actually from Wooden Bassett. So he went into the book as well. Then I decided I was going to include a few other places, Toppenham, 
just down the road from us. So lots of people from Tottenham were moving in and out of town at that stage in Baston. Both of them had manors, which were, there were a lot of employees in those areas. Baston also had the timber yard, which is still there today. So they, they were all very local areas where the, the people would have been present in the town quite a lot. Hook was Bob's fault. I blame you for this one. <laughs> Bob researches Purton. And we left a horrible huge gap between Purton and Wooden Bassett. And both of us were aware of some fantastic stories in Hook. We felt it couldn't be left out. So Hook appeared, that's the top of the memorial. Hook appeared next. I concentrated on, on that quite a bit. Hay Lane. Do you know Hay Lane? It runs from um, Sudley Grange, where the Bloom's Garden Centre is. And then it goes over towards the motorway, which is the bit you all know. And then it goes over behind Lydia Park. It's actually a really long road that goes right behind the park. And once you start at one end of Hay Lane, you can't really not to do the rest of it. So I ended up doing Hay Lane. It also includes um, Tupel in Mannington. I'm still working on that area, but during the course of the research, I was given that Hay Lane War Memorial, a postcard of it, which I think very few people have seen. And it's fantastic. There are more names and regiments that I could work with that I'm still working through today. Once you've got Hook and Hay Lane, you also have Lydia Trigos. Um, St Mary's Lydia Trigos is a little church that's in Lydia Park, which is so worth a visit. It's a fabulous church, full of amazing artwork and carvings and things. Um, the Roll of Honour there is kept in a locked box, so I don't even see two pages of it, but thankfully they let me into it a few weeks ago. And I now have photographs of all the pages, and I can go to it and make sure we've got all the men from Lydia Trigos. Um, the little teddy bear you can see there is Arthur. Here is Arthur. <laughs> now, Arthur is the cousin of Ted. I'm going to tell you about Ted a little bit, just because he's, he's fun and he's what I'm all about, really. Ted is a teddy bear who's travelling around England. He's only started recently, but his role is to tell people about history and to visit World War I Great War memorials and to try to open doors to, um, to get children to engage with history get people to see what's on their doorsteps. So that project is ongoing. And while Ted's off travelling around the country, he's been to London Docklands and Lake Park and Northfield Bassett and he's, he's now with the cluster of Wiltshire schools. Um, and Arthur stays at home so he can do things with me. And my son Wilbur is at the back. <laughs> That's Arthur. And you probably spot him around. So the, the, the project was growing all the time. There was a geographical area that I wanted to concentrate on and I was looking mostly at men who had died. Um, and then, while I was working in the British Legion Hall again, I ended up meeting the most wonderful Ken Scott, who I think some of you know quite well, others not. Ken was a, a D-Day veteran, um, and he was dead at Rat. And Ken told me that he really loved hearing the stories of the old boys when he was in the British Legion. Um, he called them the old boys, that's not me. Um, and, oh, are we going on? Yes, we are. That's the opening of the Remembrance Garden and some of the old boys that he was referring to. And Ken felt their stories were as important as the stories of the men who had died. And I totally agree with that. I wanted their lives to be honoured as well. So, thanks to Ken, I included more people again. Ken told me one day, when we were sitting in the hall, Oh, I think there's about eight of them, the old boys. And I said, well, keep thinking, see if you can come up with some more for me. But we managed to get about four names, and he was creeping up to about eight people he remembered. But we were getting stuck around that level. So I thought, oh, this is going to be easy. I'll have no trouble at all putting in all the ones that survived. And then I started doing it, and I've ended up with over 250. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ken. <laughs> I should say, Ken Allen has a copy of my book, and he's about three quarters of the way through it, which is all credit to Ken, because he's 92 now, so... 92? Mm -hmm. I think he is. And he's doing very well with it. The problem with researching the men who didn't die is that there's a lot less information about them. You've got no graves, no Commonwealth War Graves record, no newspaper coverage. All these things are really hard to find information about these men. There's nothing to see. No memorials. Soldiers died in the Great War is a standard reference to get information, nothing. And then there's the Blitz. The Blitz destroyed about 60% of service records, and the good ones look something like that now. So you can see the sort of issues that you get, and often 
were very, very broken up. Um, and many, like my great uncle, there's no service record at all. So researching those who survived, you think it'd be easier, but it's actually harder in a lot of ways. Oh, it went too far. The, that one is to illustrate another point, which is that you get names which are duplicates, and it's really hard to work out which is which. George Hunt is actually the most common name in this area. There's hundreds of George Hunts. I can't begin to tell you how much trouble George Hunt caused me. And the other reason it caused a huge problem is there's a fantastic story about a mythical George Hunt, um, which is quoted in the book. And I wanted to try and find out if he really was a George Hunt, who he was. I know now why they chose the name George Hunt, because it's such a common name. So that sort of thing makes life very difficult when you've got different names to identify and, and you can't do so. So it's going to keep doing it in one shot now, isn't it? So my decision was to try and work literally door to door and find out who was in each house, what they were doing, whether they had a service record, if I could find it, and also to see whether they had some other record, like a tribunal record, explaining why they weren't serving. So I went literally every single house in Wooden Basset to see if I could find them. And that's a picture of Wood Street, that 1907 I think that one is. The next stage, the major stage of my work was in mainly Swindon Library, looking through microfiches, where they had all the newspapers on the beach. So I was able to look through those, spent long, long hours there, fabulous place. We start there at once with us as these guys will vouch. Um, so I rather enjoyed it. So I'm afraid my husband didn't see very much of me for about a year while I was going through all the newspapers. National Archives, fantastic resources, improving all the time, lots of good information there. Commonwealth War Graves Commission. You can imagine how much time I'm spending online here. The wardrobe is our local regimental museum. That's down in Salisbury. They've got the war diaries and lots of other good useful information, particularly helpful for soldiers who served before the Great War. Um, and in fact, lots of good materials there. And I spent a lot of time hanging about in graveyards, I'm afraid. <laughs> Um, I do get some funny looks from time to time, and I'm afraid I also go, when I go on holiday, I have to go and <coughs> go as well. I'm completely addicted to the information you can find from them, and it really helps to, to put in context what you're doing. So, yes, although it's slightly odd. That's Samuel Hart, and the reason I've included him is because that was the first family photo that I saw. I saw a picture of him much later, but his family's photo, which is in the museum here, beautiful photograph and he's missing from it. And that was encouraging me to try to look at the whole family, to think about what all of them were doing and not just the soldier because it was the people at home that kept things going. And I want to look at the businesses, that's Angela Netta's. I noticed on the slideshow that the state was showing over there and there was some information about the older Angela Netta, who was the Bassett family. Schools, what were they up to? I wanted to know that. That's John Searle, who I mentioned earlier, who read the Robert Bonner details. It's Mr. Turk, one of the farmers. I wanted to know what the farmers were doing. And that's one of the questions that was asked quite often. And what were the farmers up to? How did they survive without men? And what the women were doing. I haven't been able to find a lot of photos of groups of women. This one's actually Bravenstone, that's a sewing and knitting group. So the women all found different ways to contribute to the war effort. But the more I found, the more I wanted to know. So this project's growing and growing, you can imagine. I made lots of family trees on Ancestry. Um, probably about 200, 300 of them I had encountered recently. Every time I found a soldier, I wanted to know who his family was, what they were up to, and if possible, I wanted to trace the descendants. And that was a two-way thing. One was to find out if I had any information that I could give them, and one would find out if they have information they can give me. And it's probably been the most rewarding thing that I have done, is working with relatives. And I, I've met a few, um, and without exception, they wanted the stories to be told. That's been something quite important to me, that I need to know that I'm doing the right thing by men and by their families. So I carry on doing that. I am addicted to it, and I'm still looking and speaking to families almost every day now and um, trying to sort out um, stories that, that they and I can't work out to try and get more evidence together and sort it all out. So all this information that I was gathering took me about a year and a half and the 
anniversary of the breaking and out of the war was coming rather close and I wasn't anywhere near finishing. So we decided I had to put a deadline on this and I had to stop. So I sent off my proof to the printers and waited and it eventually came back. And during that process I went into the coffee shop around the corner and I was given another man with a photo. Now you're given another man with a photo, you have to include him, don't you? You can't just leave him out. So three more weeks got added onto my print run and I completely missed the deadline. Um, but I'm pleased he's in there. And eventually the first hundred copies arrived. That's me and my dog Monty, who's a local celebrity. And um, I'm very, very happy to receive them. But everyone was asking me, do you feel proud? You must feel really proud of this achievement. And the answer was no, I didn't. I was so conscious, I still am so conscious that it's not finished. And I couldn't feel proud because I wanted to tell the rest of the stories. I wanted to know more. I knew that there was going to be mistakes in the book and gaps in the book. So yeah, it's 740 pages. I had to stop somewhere, but it's not finished. And I don't feel proud, but I feel as if I'm on the way. I've done something that hopefully will work out well in the end. One of the ways I've dealt with that is to put the website together. So the website now contains all the information I'm finding after the book. So as it arrives, I add it straight away and it can be shared. I think history, historical information is there to be shared. It's very important that it gets out there, that people can correct it, talk about it, and go on from there. So everything is, is on there now. The other project I've been involved with is the Reef, which some of you might have seen on the War Memorial. Every time there's a, an anniversary of one of the deaths, and also on November 11th, um, I put the wreath out. And it's unusual, it's the only one that isn't poppies. And the reason for that is because um, the poppy wasn't adopted by the British Legion until 1921. I wanted it to have traditional flowers that they would have grown in those days, so we've, we've got that in brief. The white chrysanthemums that you can see at the bottom are there because um, the, this lady actually, Rose Lawrence, she was the daughter of Sam Lawrence, the carrier's arms. She was working in Kensington after the war and she decided that she would place a bouquet of white chrysanthemums on the cenotaph in London, on half of the town. Um, and it was the only flower that I knew was used for remembrance at that early stage, connected with the town. So that's why I, I wear a white chrysanthemum for remembrance, not a poppy. It's not that I don't support the British Legion, it's just that this connects me to what I'm researching. And then I put a poster like that one into the window of the post office, who very kindly agreed to display it, so that I can share the stories of the men as well on the anniversary of their death. So George was, um, was one of those men, the first time that I had a photo for, who was a rather fantastic November of the stosh. Yeah, I think he'd be proud to, uh, to have shared. So, to give you a flavour, I don't know if you're expecting me to talk more about Wooden Bassett itself in the time, so this is just a little brief bit about what it was like. Um, it was a population just under 2,000, so very much a, a middling place between a village and a town. In some of the references that I read, it was referred to as a village and others as a town. It was also, I put it in brackets there, because that controversy about whether it's Bassett or Wooden, or Wooden Bassett, was still going on a hundred years before now. <laughs> they were still discussing it, and they tended to say Bassett. So I'm quite proud to be in the, the right camp. It was a market town. I'm sure you've all seen pictures of it with cattle in the, the road like that. And um, the weekly cattle markets, and bigger ones from time to time, and a couple of auctioneers in the high streets. So it got lots of activity in the market and farming. The dairy, which down Station Road, was going strong at that stage, known then as a dairy supply company. We're predating St. Idol here. And it was also famous for pigs. Um, <laughs> it was, uh, there was a bacon factory um, just behind the Ganges, where there's now um, the builder's yard. And they used to drive the pigs in between the Ganges and the carrier's arms. So, August the 4th, war was declared and um, Wooden Bassett's must have changed quite quickly. Um, the first thing that happened was that all the reservists were called up, and those are people who had served previously, before the war. So they would have gone off to their regiments, lots of them were Wiltshires, they would have gone into Swindon or to Devizes, um, and, or Marlborough. Um, and then 
the volunteers were also called up, they would have gone um, that evening, the first evening, August the 4th, there was a big meeting in Swindon and they, um, I don't know if any of you ever heard it, that steam, there's, there's still the whistle that blows um, and that, that whistle was sounded 12, uh, 10 times at 7 o'clock that night and all the territorials had to report for duty. So very quickly everybody was out. Um, there were six Fulton Bessic men, men who arrived on the Western Front at the beginning. August 14th they went out to France and only one of those six men came back. So it was a massive thing sending out people who were already in service. On August 30th, there was our first recruitment meeting. I thought that didn't happen until later, so I was quite surprised to see it happening so early. Um, this is Colonel Kelly. Um, he was at Birdrick Park, which had already been taken over by the army um, as barracks. You all heard it called Draycott Camp, or Chiselden Camp. Um, so he was quite a, a top brass person to come to Gordon Bassett and talk to us. Um, and we were lucky enough to have his speech. Now this was made in the, you know, the old Nick down Station Road, that police court next door to that. Um, that's where he made his recruitment speech. So these are the actual words that he said, and I read, read these very early on in my research, obviously working through um, newspapers. At a time like this, it is everybody's business to come forward and help the country. At the present moment, party politics are dead and done away with them, and all is for the state. We will stand shoulder to shoulder. Now, those of you who are Bassett folk will know shoulder to shoulder is such a common term these days that, that we felt very strongly during the repatriations. And it was extraordinary for me to read that. I don't know if it gives you a bit of a shudder, but it, it did me to see that written 100 years ago. There might be and are many who do not know anything about the cause of war. And some might say they do not want war. We are a peace-loving nation. We have a large empire. We do not want any more territory. We are a Christian people, and war is a denial to Christianity. No one should go to war unless there is a just reason. Now we find ourselves in the midst of a great and terrible war, and we have to make an urgent appeal for men. We are at war for two things chiefly. First, our honour is involved through the neutrality of Belgium, which as a state was guaranteed by the great powers of Europe, and one of the chief signatories was Germany. Yet the moment Germany saw her chance, she said, what is a treaty? A piece of paper that can be torn up. But not so with Britain. We've given our pledged word and we'll back us up by all the force in our power. We will stand to our word. Now, in the paper it reports cheers at that and you can really imagine it, can't you? And that's a really inspiring speech. After that, there was a little pause. People were fighting and Thankfully, the first reports came back from the Herald that nobody had been killed in Northern Bassett. But the names started to get closer and closer to the town. Eli White, one of the first, was from Tottenham. George Sawyer, who we met moments ago with his wonderful moustache, he's in Hay Lane. Then in November, two of our men were taken prisoner. There's some connection here with Perton. Um, Bob can tell you more about them. Um, these two, Frank Sly and Reginald Beecham, taken prisoner and sent to Germany, and they remained there for the rest of the war. So they experienced one kind of hell, and the soldiers who served on experienced another. We had Belgian refugees move into the town in November as well. That was the house that was occupied by the Belgians, and I'm, I'm working on finding them at the moment. So I've got a, a Belgian family history group helping with that. We thought we'd got them, and then we found out they weren't them, and now we're after another family, so we're, we're, we're nearly there. It's not easy doing research. And I'm waiting for the Belgian State Archives to answer an email at the moment, but hopefully eventually. Um, this is a, the 7th Wiltshires on an recruitment march. They toured right round the North Wiltshire area. That's them in Sherston, but that same group, the same band, came right through Wilton Bassett High Street. So these things were happening and the town were becoming more and more aware of the war actually being on the doorstep there. So I want to bring home to you something about what it was like being at war when you were from this town. Um, and I chose somebody who I thought had a really good story to tell. Um, this is Conley. His parents lived at Laurel Villa, which is on the corner of Cockstalls and the High Street. Quite a nice brick house that's there. Um, 
He was an outfitter by trade, as you can see there, and he was a relation of, of um, Richard Jefferies, the naturalist, who Christ knows lots about. Um, and uh, he was interested in primroses. When he retired, he belonged to the Primrose Association, and he even had a, an award named after him. So he was a quite a sensitive man, I think, and that sort of comes over a little bit in the stories he tells. He joined the Army, Army Service Corps, and he went over to Gallipoli. Um, he was quartermaster, so he was dealing with the supplies out there. Um, that's not to say that he didn't experience extraordinary things, because he had to go out with those supplies to the front line. And as a result of that, he <coughs> ended up with an MBE and a military cross, um, and didn't stop there. He went on to serve in World War II. So an extraordinary person. Um, I'm going to read you an account of his, but when I read it, that's a picture of uh, an Australian, I think it's a British one, but that's an Australian Army Service Corps depot, which gives you a bit of an idea of the sort of place he might <coughs> be working. He said, um, minutes for over a week as I've been nearly rushed off our legs. We've been having lovely weather until last Friday when we had a most terrible storm. I've never seen anything like it. Sounds quite casual at the moment, doesn't it? It gets worse. <coughs> About 4.30 on Friday some big clouds came up and there was some lightning and then it began literally to fall down. Soon all the place was a swamp and my supply depot was one raging torrent knee deep. We were issuing supplies and had to work in all this water and as the food had to be got up to the troops. After finishing in the depot, I went to my dugout in the side of a hill, and I found that flooded, all my books and accounts floating about, blankets wet, and everything else. The storm finished up about 9 p.m., and you can form no idea what it was like. Raging torrents from the hills were found everywhere, and many of our fellows were going through water up to their waists. About 10.30 p.m., a freezing wind set in, which made everything worse. The troops in the firing line had their trenches flooded, and many were drowned while I hear the Turks had hundreds share a similar fate. I was about most of the night, seeing to the men that were fighting with lighting fires and drying themselves as best they could. I was soaked from about my knees downwards. Saturday, it started to rain and snow, and we of the Army Service Corps were, were rushed all day, getting rum, brandy, oxo, cocoa, medical comforts and food up to the troops. About 8 p.m. I had orders to get supplies over to Hill 10. It was blowing a blizzard, but off I went with some men and loaded up, and finally got to my destination about 12.30 a.m. after ploughing through mud and slush up to my knees at times, and it was pitch dark. There, it was awful. The trenches were absolutely full, and the poor fellows were dying of exposure. It was indeed a sight I shall never forget. Arriving back at my depot about 2 a.m., I laid down to snatch a few hours sleep, but I can assure you that wet blankets, etc., are not comfortable, and by morning the blankets were frozen stiff. I had a good stiff dose of whiskey and gave my men some, and I believe it was due to that that I'd not felt any the worse for it. Some day we were at it again, and it was freezing hard, and the wind was so rough one could hardly stand up. We were rushing food, etc., up all day, and warm clothing as well. <coughs> Monday the same, and then I went up again myself in the evening, and the fellows were being sent away from the firing line with frostbite and exposure, and were rolled up in blankets, and piled in carts, just like sacks. I hardly knew whether I had a beak or not, so cold it was. I love the way he goes from these horrible images, these, I'm all right, mum, don't worry about me images, it's lovely. Here is a story of our brigade, he says. A company of chilled men were brought back to the shelters, and when they arrived, the officer asked if anyone would volunteer to go and get some rum from headquarters. And one man stepped out and said he would go. He went and got the rum, but did not return. And in the morning, Monday, a search party went out for him, and they found him, sitting under a bush with the two bottles under his arms, and not even the seals broken. But he was dead. Died from exposure, poor fellow. Surely it can be said of him, he gave his life for his friends. This story is true, and I'm proud to belong to a brigade where such men are found. I'm through my 
second reading from the book, um, I'm looking at Private Oswald Bertram Ballard. He was a, a chemist's son, believe it or not, same building as Boots today, which I, I think is amazing that he's been a chemist all these years. Um, Oswald didn't stay in Wooden Brass, he went out to Canada and became a fruit farmer. And uh, he joined the Comic Satin Battalion, that's their badge there, and came back to Europe to serve. As I read his account, I'm going to leave you with a picture of Augustus Montague's sergeants that, that he drew in the, he painted in the trenches. Um, he would have just the grand corner from Comley, who I quoted from earlier. Uh, his parents probably knew each other, and he unfortunately didn't make it. He died in 1918. Um, but his picture illustrates the trenches so beautifully, um, and I think that's fantastic to have a, something that somebody from Bassett painted and is so evocative. Um, his account of being just arrived in the trenches for the first time was published in the Hastings newspaper um, because he was there after the war. So I'd love to, to have this one. We left the town behind us and now could see quite plainly the flame sent up from the German trenches, although it was difficult to say how much further we had yet to go. We halted at some crossroads while a consultation took place between our officers and the guide. Before we moved on again, we were told to march in single file with an interval between each man and thus to lessen the effect of any shell which might drop between us. On we went, floundering into shell holes which now began to dot the road, feeling tired and hungry and not very warlike. At last the head of the line dived down a slip at the side of the road, and the rest followed. We were in the communication trench. Then began such a doubling and twisting as not even the most crooked amongst us had ever imagined. The distance seemed endless. Our rifles would wedge in the sides and cause delay and bad language. But at last we came to a place where the trench widened, and there for a brief space we halted. It was afterwards, I learned, the battalion headquarters, and consisted of quite a number of dugouts. What battalion are you? asked a sentry who stood on guard. We told him. Some of your fellows had a blue of a time this afternoon. I think there were about 40 casualties. What were you doing? Where are you, sorry, where are you doing? To the front line. The front line, they say, is down. So did we get a job's comfort to start with. On we went again, every man thinking his own thoughts, which were not the brightest. More twisting, more doubling, more stumbling. The line came to a stop. What's the matter in front? asked the fellows behind. Make way for stretchers, came back the answer, passed from man to man. More men were coming on behind us. We could not go back. To pass was impossible. The trench was deep and to climb out difficult. At the back of the line I waited, wondering what was happening in front. Presently the line began to move. As we advanced, part of the communication trench blown away. The trenches at that part being built of sandbags above the ground, not sunk into it. Passing these, we were told to keep low, and not without reason, as every now and then, machine gun, gun bullets would whistle overhead. At last we made a turn to the right, and we were in the front line. It must have been about one o'clock in the morning, and since the evening before, when we lay about the camp, we seemed to have reached a new world. Afterwards, helped by daylight and familiarity, the strangeness of it all wore away, but that night it was different. Silent figures stood still and watched. Silent figures walked past. The darkness hid their faces. They loomed up big in their greatcoats. They might have been ebony mutes performing mysterious rites among the battered ruins of some ancient temple. You see a man's face, and in time too short to tell, you grasp his personality. He becomes familiar. But here, no faces are seen. No character read. Darkness had made them passionless creatures apart. In one place, the trench for some 30 yards after the bombardment of the day before had ceased to exist. But even this was beginning to rise again, for maybe a hundred men were working there. Dark figures were passing sandbags from hand to hand. I heard no whispers even, saw no great hurry, but work which went with a steadiness which gave it almost a rhythm. Death was around, watching and waiting and greedy for life. Not one of those silent men could say for certain that in five minutes' time he would be live. A flare goes up and instantly every figure becomes rigid. For a moment they bring a stream of bullets. The light dies down, and once more the figures move, and seemingly take no notice of us as we pass by. We come at last to a part of the trench which juts out. It's a machine gun bay. Here two of us are left, and the rest go on. 
I dimly see one dark figure peering out into no man's land. Another comes up to us and says, you fellows had better crawl into that bunk hole and get some sleep. I'll wake you when wanted. My partner crawls in and I follow. For a while I lay awake and listen to the noise of the machine guns and the crack of rifles, which every now and then break out with renewed vigour. After a while, sleep intervenes and our strange surroundings are forgotten. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I, I love that the stories that I've uncovered are being shared and sort of, you know, hopefully all will come to light. I'm still trying to find relatives of the rounds and I haven't succeeded in that yet. So um, it would be nice. I've been speaking to one of the boys, remains if I'm just heavily, um, was in St. Neots and I've managed to find records of somebody else who lived in St. Neots and served on the Abbey as well. So the parents must have known each other. And that was thanks to a museum, and there's nothing, museums, there's all the different museums and, and archives all around the country, they've been so helpful. And of course it's good information. So he's on the lookout, if anybody turns up there. Um, and also I've got messages out on the um, Live Lake Forum, which is um, the website especially for the Abbey and Bastion Hogue, hoping that some relatives will appear there. I've been in touch with Chatham, see if anybody came there, but it's unfortunately Your glass of water. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone got any questions? Yeah. This way. I was interested in the painter. Um, are, yeah. are there other paintings? That I, I don't. They've got about three paintings, apparently, that he's done. Well, and where are they? Are they yeah, the, the family. They're not local anymore. Um, and they were kind enough to let me use that one. And, and to enjoy the fact it's out there now, I'd like to get that display at some point. But, um, yeah, it's, it's just lovely to have access to things like that. And they were so thrilled that his story was going to be told as well. Yeah. It's quite quite moving painting, isn't it? Ooh, <laughs> I think it's an observation really, Cheryl. You know, you look back and you think, well, why didn't you have a clue what Dad did? Yeah. And yes. I realised that I was a boy in yes. the Second World War. Yeah. My dad was now working hard in an establishment yes. to help the Second World War effort. We tend to think it's only because this year the 100 centenary has come up that you realise that in your youth, you weren't asking about the First World War, everyone was concentrating now on the Second World War. So yeah. you tend to relate to your age, don't you? And yes. And, and I suppose. I feel quite like guilty, you know, look back yeah. at me, but yes. would you have asked about the First World War when you've got. Yeah. Places around being bombed, you know. Um, yes. Well, one, yeah. one of the, um, the sons that I spoke to told me a, a lovely story about how he would stand outside the door of the kitchen and listen to his father talking to his brothers, uh, his father's brothers, his uncles, um, about his experiences. He didn't dare ask his father in person what had happened. He found out because he'd overheard those conversations and he never, throughout his father's life, actually spoke to him about it. So he was, again, somebody who was able to tell me some things, but I was able to tell him some things which, which were very valuable to him. Yeah. Now, if you ever seen me out with photos of the camera, um, I know it's slightly odd to be photographing memorials and things, and I'm conscious that some of you may think it's a bit offensive. But the reason I do it is because I want those photographs to go back to the families, and I've been able to send them back to families in Australia, Canada, um, New Zealand, America. Um, and let them know what we're doing to remember their relatives, which means something to them. And sometimes there are families who are going to be at the point where the, the relative died, they're going to be in France or in Gallipoli or wherever. Um, and to know that something is happening here on the day means something to them as well. So I'm, I think it's quite important to do that and to spread the story as much as I can. I could walk longer hours, couldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> Rest your brains. <laughs> so, thank you very much, Sheridan. I think we're so lucky in, in a role that we've had it to have a historian who has done all this research for us. Um, so let's just give our Sheridan a <laughs> Exhibits um, at the back from the museum, and also um, a screen presentation, which you can.